Hello and welcome to Fire in the Valley. Today we have myself, Mighty Pete, and we're joined by the Jeremy Carberry. Good morning, good afternoon to you, and good evening to me. Hello, hello. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. It's always fun working out the time difference. So I'm currently in Ireland, you're in California. Listen, it's always it's always good. We're transatlantic, that's what it's all about, right? Oh yeah, I like it. So listen, welcome to the show, Jeremy. Tell us who are you, what do you do, and where are you from? So I am Jeremy Carberry, like you said. I am uh, currently in Southern California. I work as a wilderness kayak guide here, an animal handler, and uh, have a podcast coming out where I interview people that have survived animal attacks. Have you survived an animal attack? Oh, yeah. <laughs> a couple. <laughs> <laughs> give, give us the headlines then. There's bound, there's bound to be something in there with teeth. Oh yeah. Um, for me personally, um, I've, I've been bit and stung by, uh, multiple things, uh, snakes, stingrays, uh, urchin, sea urchin, had some close calls with bears, sharks, sea lions. I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the wilderness a lot. I'm in the ocean a lot. And eventually, you know, you're going to cross paths with some of these characters. So it's happened to me. <laughs> Is it almost like a rite of passage, you know, to have the scars, to have the, the tales of the one that got away? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Probably. <laughs> I never thought of it that way, but yeah. yeah I mean, like, you can't have every, everyone you I know, when I, when I got to California, you know, I was obsessed with sharks and everyone I know who is regularly out on the water surfing or diving or whatever you know they they like to be on the ocean everyone has seen a white shark at some point you know it's just it's it, it's gonna happen hopefully it's it's not gonna take a part of you with it but it's gonna happen cool what's what's the go-to then what's the ultimate for you to go see or experience do you have something on top of your list yeah i i would really like to travel to uh like africa and australia south america and and uh, see some animals that we don't have in North America and, you know, talk to people who've had interactions with them. That's, that's on my to-do list. Hopefully in the next year or two, I'll be able to do one of those trips. Cool. Well, tell us, first of all, what does fire in the belly mean to you? Fire in the belly. I love the, uh, I love the phrasing of that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's really good. Um, you know what, for me, if I'm in the recording studio working on music or if I'm, you know, out on the ocean in a sea cave on a kayak and I'm doing something that I'm passionate about and I love it, I'm never thinking when, when is my shift over? When do I get to clock out? Maybe, you know, maybe if there's something else that I have going on that evening, I might think about it, but I'm never like longing to get off of work. And I know that whatever work I'm doing, if I'm not looking at the clock and, and worrying about when I'm going to be done with it, then that's something that I have a fire in my belly for because I really love being there for it and I'm not trying to get out of it. <laughs> is that something you've always had there, Jeremy? Or I mean, is this something that's, that's come along sort of more recently? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I think you can. Uh, I'd love to hear your take on this as well, but I think kids and children have way more of a fire in their belly than adults do. You know, uh, as an adult, we kind of sometimes have to consciously cultivate that. I'm speaking for myself, you know, um, kind of have to consciously say like, what, what am I really excited about? And why haven't I done that in two weeks? You know, the thing that I'm excited about, whether it's learning or doing, I need to keep that going and keep that fire cultivated personally. Or, you know, sometimes we, we find ourselves getting into a rut and, and just kind of going through the motions and forgetting why we started doing these things to begin with. Yeah. The why is always an interesting one, isn't it? You know, how you actually find yourself at that particular place, you know, it's, but tell me there's, there's a bit of a sea thing going on is, is water. Is that your go-to place? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love, I love the mountains. I love the woods, but I think the ocean is my favorite. Mm. Mm. On it, in it, or in between? All of the above. <laughs> yeah. 
if I, yeah, even, even just being on the beach is pretty cool, you know, just being close to it. But uh, probably my favorite is in it. You know, if I can, if I can have a mask on and see what's swimming around, that's, that's probably my favorite. It's, it's such a, uh, it's such a different world than the, the land realm. Wow. Well, that's awesome. And tell us about, talk to us about your, uh, your, your podcast. What's going on there? Yeah. So apparently, as you probably know, there are a lot of podcasts in existence <laughs> that cover every topic that you can possibly think of. Uh, amazingly, there's not a podcast that interviews people that have survived animal attacks. And when I found that out, that blew my mind. And I just decided I need to make that happen. It's, it's got to be done, as you say. I mean, that's a, you know, it's almost a, a rite of passage, right? It's got to be, you know, who got bit the hardest or who, who got away the, the, the closest, really? Yeah, yeah, who has the best story? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's going to be a bit of a competition in there, right? You know, it's... Oh, yeah. Yeah. So how have you found it? So, I mean, it's, it's great, I mean, to be inspired by that, to get out and to, you know, really sort of understand that. And what what is your take on animal attacks? I mean, are they provoked i mean do you blame the animal do you where do you sit on all that um i don't think you can ever really blame the animal necessarily um they they do what they do they do what they've uh you know been doing for way way longer than than we showed up most of the time so um a lot of times a lot of people that i talk to they weren't necessarily doing something really stupid like trying to take a selfie with a bison <laughs> um not really interested in talking to those people either, even if they did survive that you know it's like they, they probably don't understand the animal in the first place is why they were getting so close so most of the people that i'm talking to they actually have a, a, a pretty good respect of the animals that they interact with and understanding of them and they're able to share that and share how to like keep a distance. A lot of times it's just kind of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, if you can, if you can stay um, out of the way of an animal and its food, <laughs> don't put yourself in between an animal and its food or what the animal perceives as its food. And then same thing with the animal's babies. You know, if there's babies around, you don't want to be, you want to keep a really, really wide distance. And as long as you don't, you know, encroach on their personal space and territory, there's really no reason that an animal would attack a human. There's a couple, maybe two or three species on earth where that, that that's an exception where that animal might actually be hunting you literally for your meat. But those, ex those examples are very far and few between. Um, and the main ones I think are polar bears and Siberian tigers. And they live in the most uninhabitable regions of the world, you know, the Arctic and the Siberia and, and Russia, where there's literally nothing to eat. You know, they're, they're, humans aren't on their diet, but they're opportunistic. And if it comes down to them starving to death or eating a person, they're definitely going to eat a person. But I mean, generally, we're not going to be in Siberia or the Arctic anyways, so we don't really have to worry about those things. That's super interesting. I mean, so yeah, I mean, you, you're either you're in the way or you're a potential threat. So they, there's one of the two reasons that they're coming at you. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it kind of like a warning shot? I mean, they're, I take it they're not sort of they're, they're not biting at you necessarily to get a get a bit of food. It's kind of to get rid of you. Yeah, I would say I don't I don't want, I don't want to guess numbers, but the the vast majority of animal attacks don't happen because a human is being hunted. They happen because that human got in their personal space. They got too close to their food. They got too close to their babies. That's most of the attacks. Kind of know how to feel like, you know, if you're, if someone gets in front of your food, you, you kind of want to reach out and just give them a good bite. Yeah. 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 And it's interesting at the more, the more interviews I do, you just see it's, it's <laughs> this person got attacked. Well, did you get in between its food or its babies? <laughs> Usually it's one or the other. <laughs> well, that's it. I'm just going to make sense, right? You know, because that's that, that their habitat, you know, their, their habitat and you're in it. So, no, it's yeah. cool. Yeah. So tell me, I mean, you know, passion for you. I mean, where where is your happy place? Is it, you know, 
you, you've mentioned a couple of things there out in the wild, you, you know, talking, being on your sea kayak, sea caves. Where's your go-to? Yeah, I think the ocean is definitely the, the place. It's um, especially the Pacific Ocean, you know, uh, similar to your, your ocean. It's, it's, it's m- rough more than it's calm, mm-hmm. you know. Um, you go places like Hawaii or the Caribbean, um, especially earlier in the day, you can get some pretty calm oceans. But out here, it's generally pretty rough or at least, you know, moving. It's not completely peaceful. So to be on the ocean, it's, it's a very engaging process, you know, whether it's swimming, snorkeling, free diving, kayaking, all those things I, I love to do. You have to be aware of where the waves are. You have to be aware of where the rocks are, where, you know, there's, it's very engaging and it's hard to be thinking or worrying about other things when you're engaging with the ocean so it's very uh meditative and relaxing and i i love it do, do you see sort of reoccurring animals and do you you know do you is there certain animals you would actually connect with oh uh, yeah like a specific individual hmm. yeah <laughs> like okay yeah that's like, <laughs> that's that's a good direction for the question um yeah so species definitely definitely see a lot of the same species um and even individual animals yeah uh i like to take photos as well and i learned this from uh, some other nature photographers is the first time that you see an animal in its habitat that's probably not going to be the best pictures that you get right because that animal doesn't know what your deal is it's kind of looking at you out of the side of its eye it's not really necessarily going about its business might just get away from you um but maybe the 20 or 30th time that you see that specific individual animal and it says oh well that's the guy with the big weird contraption that just kind of minds his own business i'm going to just go about my business i don't perceive that person as a threat anymore and a lot of a lot of animals they can they can actually recognize individuals, individual humans, you know, and they know like, well, this human's not hunting me or this human's not going to bother me. They're just kind of doing their thing. So in that, in that situation, yeah. um, You kind of like, you can kind of develop a rapport with an animal and, and give them a safe distance where they, after so many interactions, they kind of start to recognize you and, then that's where you can get some really cool photos and video because that animal is just going about its life and it's not worried about you. I mean, there is that, what was that film on Netflix? It was My Octopus Teacher or something? Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, yeah it was awesome, wasn't it? I mean, this yeah. almost a strange relationship they got over a year. It's like, yeah, yeah. No, it was cool. I mean, that, that sort of, I mean, is that something, you know, for you, it's, it's being involved and being that sort of interactive with nature. Is that, is that something that does it for you? Yeah, that, that's a really um, interesting story that my octopus teacher, because pretty much that guy made observing that octopus, his life, <laughs> he was out there every day, you know? Um, unfortunately, most of us don't have that opportunity. <laughs> we have lives, we have kids, we have, you know, work, um, so maybe, maybe we'll see the same animal, you know, once a week or whatever. Um, so that, that was kind of a, un, un not a normal circumstances that that guy found himself in where he got to have that really awesome relationship with a literally wild animal that, you know, it's a really fantastic story, but yeah, I see, I definitely, I think I've seen the same octopus. They do generally have their little den in a reef or in a rock. And especially at night here in California, they're more active at night. So yeah, I'll, I'll be swimming around a corner and I'll go, oh, this is where that, that medium sized two spot octopus is usually hanging out, you know? And then, you know, maybe I won't see him right away, but usually he'll, th- that octopus will be within, you know, maybe 50, 50, 60 feet of its den, you know, and I'll see it night after night if I'm in a certain area. Um, I haven't gotten to the level where like, you know, establish that trust with an octopus specifically. I would like to, um, sometimes I'll dive down and hold my breath and just kind of hang out there. Um, a lot of, a lot of spear fishermen hunt octopus in California. So they're, I think they're especially wary of humans (laughs) where I'm diving a lot of times, but, uh, yeah, other animals like uh, moray eels 
or a specific fish actually. Um, there's specific fish that if you dive in an area over and over, they'll, they'll just get to know like, okay, that's that one guy. I don't have to worry about him trying to eat me and they'll actually be curious. Come check you out. Oh, that's cool. I mean, it's sort of that interactiveness. So tell us, I mean, a, a wilderness, you know, that sort of wilderness sort of um, tour. I mean, what, what, what does that normally involve taking people out there? Well, a wilderness is, uh, at least in the States, it's considered somewhere that is uh, not, there's no people that live there, right? There's no infrastructure, no electricity, oftentimes no roads, um, oftentimes no cell phone service. Um, you you kind of have to know what you're doing when you get out there and uh, you have to bring your supplies. And I think a lot of people go to the wilderness because they want to escape civilization. You know, they want to escape the maybe unpleasant parts of civilization, at least for a time, and uh, enjoy nature. And it's also, it, it can be a challenge. Um, a lot of people serve, a lot of people equate survival with wilderness. That's not necessarily my angle. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm surviving, meaning um, I might die if things go wrong, that's not a situation that I voluntarily put myself into. That means something has gone wrong, you know, where I've lot, I, I don't have any food. I don't, I'm lost. Uh, an animal, you know, has some, has, has interacted with me in in a negative way. So yeah, I'm not really uh, attracted to the whole survival aspect, but that does seem to be something that people equate with wilderness a lot. I've noticed those two words are kind of connected for most people. Um, I don't think that's actually the case in reality. It's funny, isn't it? You know, and even just using the word connected, it's it's probably, I would imagine for a lot of people, it's, it's just disconnecting from this sort of crazy world. I mean, we're lucky enough to be speaking, I'm going to hazard a guess and say sort of three or 4,000 miles apart, you know, and pretty <laughs> seamlessly, you know, and we're connected, we're super connected. You know, we've got our phones, we've got the internet, we've got this, got this, got this, and yet so stepping into the world that you represent it's 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 almost a connection with nature but not with technology right it's just a just a different thing yeah yeah and and it's not that we don't have technology out there in the wilderness you know some people have satellite phones or a, or a radio or a, um, like a solar panels to charge stuff so we, we do bring technology out there but it's definitely not as connected and as efficient as it is in civilization. It's hard to sit out in your sea kayak and watch YouTube, you know, it's, it's, it's not <laughs> well, really. Why would, why would you look at YouTube when you have all this amazing stuff happening all around you? You don't even want to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. It's there. It's, it's happening right in front of you, right? That's, that's, yeah. that, that's that disconnection. Tell me, is this something you've always done? I mean, when, when did this all start really? Or Oh yeah. Ever since I was a kid, I, I loved being outside. I, we're fortunate to grow up in Ohio on Lake Erie, which is one of the Great Lakes. And uh, um, really fortunate, we had a big backyard and then woods behind that backyard. So me and my brother, you know, we would always be out exploring rivers, lakes, streams, little hills, woods, whatever, every day, something different. And was, was school a good thing for Jeremy? How did that go? <laughs> well school kept me inside so i didn't love it <laughs> i wanted to be outside <laughs> but uh yeah it was all right i guess i don't know it could it could it's gone worse for other people <laughs> it's always a bit of a conflict isn't it when you're running into school or running out of school most people are running yeah. out it's like yeah yeah <laughs> definitely <laughs> kind of gotta do it but yeah let's let's get out and is, is your brother as big into to nature as yourself or how did that work out um professionally no but he loves being outside as well yeah mm -hmm. i mean and his kids where was your go-to as a kid i mean backyard stuff or you know we out in the water typically yeah um when i was really young you know we were not allowed to leave the yard so because <laughs> we're just little kids you know so yeah the front yard the backyard the side yard it, it's it's interesting I never thought about this, but it's interesting that whenever you have a limited um, area, you can, how much you can find in that limited area, you know? Sure. Whether it's in how many different animals and different rocks and plants and, and you can just, you can just, even though you go there every day, you'll still find new things and find new fascinations. And um, 
so as a kid, yeah, just, just our yard where I was allowed to be, I would find lots of really cool, fascinating bugs and snakes and everything else. And then, uh, and then when I got older, uh, I think I was definitely drawn to more water things, you know, whether it's a stream or a lake, uh, something about, something about the water and, the, and the, its inhabitants has always fascinated me. I, I used to have a lot of fish tanks. So I'd catch, you know, some minnows or catch like an injured pickerel, which is kind of like a pike, and then take that injured pickerel, put it in the fish tank and then feed it like little guppies until it got better and healthier. And then we'd let it go. And just stuff like that was like the most fun. That was really rewarding for us as kids. I was going to say, were you guys like, you know, having stuff all over the place for you, sort of animals and <laughs> taking care of them and tanks and cages and all sorts? Yeah, to, to be fair that's like probably the only example of us, of us, uh, taking care of an animal and making it better and letting it go. Usually we were just stealing them from their natural habitat for our own entertainment. <laughs> Every now and then my mom would come in our room and say, you can't keep a snake in your room. Get that out of here. <laughs> we didn't ask permission. We just bring it in the house. <laughs> oh, I can only imagine sort of random animals getting loose around the house. And <laughs> yeah. I found one time I found like up on the curtain rods, a skeleton of a lizard. <laughs> it had like escaped and then it unfortunately starved to death up there. We weren't, we weren't very uh, good caretakers as kids sometimes, but uh, yeah, that it had probably been there for like 10, 12 years. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool though. <laughs> the skeleton of a, of a lizard, I imagine be, yeah, be quite interesting. That also tells you like what's going on in like a, you know, a preteen boys room like the disgusting smells that are in a preteen boys room you have a lizard that's rotting and nobody even smells it They're like it's just a normal smelling boys room <laughs> there's probably nothing wrong with the lizard it's just the smell killed it, it was like yeah it was like... <laughs> worse than the wilderness <laughs> so what was jeremy's plan when he was going to grow up what was the original go to going to be the president of the united states <laughs> going right to the top eh yeah and then and then i kind of realized that wasn't that was definitely not the direction i wanted to go <laughs> pretty pretty quick after high school i think i figured that out so what, what was the route out of high school for you then what what was on the cards you know um i went to uh i went to college for um recording music um recording arts and technology so the audio world uh, yeah, so I got into that professionally, um, working in recording studios. And that's part of the reason why I ended up in California. A lot of, there's a lot of, uh, music and movies that happen in Los Angeles. You mentioned, I mean, this recording and, and all sound to take it, was it all sound based? I mean, was this just something in your background or where did that fascination come from? Well, I love music. Um, I, I wanted to be a professional musician. Uh, some of my friends that were way more talented than me and older than me were like not even getting any traction at all. And I realized I'm never going to be as good as they are and they're already struggling. So maybe I should change directions a little bit. I still wanted to work with music and be part of that creative process and, uh, and realize that there was a demand for audio engineers, which, which work more on the, uh, you know, technical side of things, but are still a part of the creative process. So what was your, what was your go-to on the instruments or what was your sort of passion in, in the music wise? Yeah, I played, I played saxophone in high school and, uh, you know, dabble with some guitar and keyboards. Um, and I can, I can set up a drum kit, um, working in a recording studio. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's my job to get all of the instruments set up and sounding good. Then when the real musicians come in, they just tear it up and make it awesome. You were like sort of when the when the lights go out and everyone goes home, you're beating the hell out of the drums in the studio. And sometimes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretending like I'm the rock star. <laughs> Giving a hell for the other way not. It's like, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's been there's some been some nights like that. <laughs> what's your what's your go-to on the music front then? Who who do you follow or who's your Oh yeah, lots of stuff. I actually, uh, one of my musical heroes that I actually got to work with is David Holmes, who's from your wonderful country. 
and um, he was a big influence and uh, he does a lot of uh, mu musical scores for movies. He's put out some albums of his own as well. And uh, he has a, a couple couple musical projects. One's called Unloved, which I got to uh, record. And um, <clears throat> it's it's kind of one of those situations where I like pinch myself and be like, how am I how am I in the same room with all of these, you know, my you know favorite composer and musicians and get to be a part of this team? And I don't know how it all happened. And I think, I don't think that I'm on the same level as them, but I've, I've had some really great opportunities and really great experiences working with, uh, really love film music. That's definitely a special place in my heart for that because it has such a specific purpose, you know, anybody who does art probably knows, you know, you show up and you have a blank canvas and paint, but sometimes that's overwhelming or a blank page and you're, you're trying to write something. And for me, it, it, it's kind of paralyzing. It's, it's like too overwhelming. There's too many options, you know? Whenever somebody else who's creative and awesome and that you respect gives you something like a film, you know, or even just a scene in a film, and they say, we need, we need this to flow, you know? Like, we need music to make it flow. Now it's like, there's, no, there's not a blank screen. There's not a blank slate anymore. I know exactly, okay this is the scene and what it needs is some kind of like percussion to make it move and give it some, give it a little bit more emphasis, you know, without manipulating the audience into telling them what to feel. So that, I just love that. The less I have to like overthink things in my mind, the easier my life is, you know, give me like a specific task and then I can use my creative juices towards that. You just give me a blank slate. It's kind of overwhelming. <laughs> It's always interesting. Isn't it? Some people, some people can work to create it, you know, work with something to improve it or whatever. And then other people are, yeah, blank slate. Just don't, don't sort of fill my mind with your stuff. I can just go. So isn't it funny yeah. how we're just different creatures, right? You know, it's what, what you can but hear. You know what I found though, even the people that when they're given a blank slate, they're like, Oh great. And they come up with this brilliant work. Eventually they do hit a wall, you know, where, where the blank slate used to be freedom now it's like overwhelming you know and everyone goes through different phases yeah it's always interesting i mean it's i mean when you say film work i mean is it uh, you know i mean there's probably the hell of a lot more in in that and, and the whole soundtrack behind film work than probably most people realize right you know because it is one of your key senses um yeah whenever i watch a movie it's half visual and half music <laughs> if the music if the opening sequence you know like the credit scores it's a blank black screen and the credit scores and then the music is kind of tacky or cheesy i i might not get through the first couple of scenes i'll just turn it off i'm like okay i'm done with this um or if it's you know the music's good and the visuals are good but they don't really go together I, I also kind of lose interest. So yeah, for me personally, uh, the music is half the story. Are you like a, are you a nightmare to go to the movies with? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I've walked out. <laughs> I've left the person that I went with. I can't watch this. They're like, well, it's almost over. I'm going to watch the rest of it. I'm like, I'm going to go out. I'm going to be outside. I can't stand it. <laughs> That's happened. I'll Let me doing... close the window real quick, if you don't mind. Please. Yeah, it's always fun, especially when when you know a lot about a film or the, the background or whatever, you're kind of going, yeah, I can't watch this. <laughs> it's like, it's just not my thing. No, we all have those those skills and talents, I suppose. So yeah, then I'll go outside and watch the birds in the parking lot. That's more entertaining. <laughs> yeah, and anything but, anything but. So what's, what point then did you actually start doing the, the, the wildlife tours or what's what sort of triggered all that side? So uh, yeah, at the time, uh, David Holmes was living in Los Angeles. So I was working with him a lot and a couple other people. Um, a couple of people I worked with retired, a couple other people moved, David moved back to uh, Belfast. And uh, yeah, it was just kind of, you know, there was less work and the work that was available was stuff that instead of giving me a fire in the belly, it was taking the fire out of my belly. <laughs> and I think, you know, I was young and single and, and didn't mind sleeping in my car or a tent. So I could kind of afford to just 
shift directions, you know? So whenever I did not have work in Los Angeles, I would usually drive maybe a couple hours um, somewhere that had like a really good ocean area with some awesome caves to explore or kelp forests to, to swim through or, you know, whatever. And just being on the ocean for a couple of days was like, would make me happier than anything. And, and, you know, it was getting to the point where I was spending more and more time in the ocean and, and less time in the recording studio. And I was just thinking, you know what, I need to figure out a way how I can be on the ocean and get paid for that. <laughs> so then I don't, I can still go and work in the recording studio, but it, but I don't have to, you know, maybe I can stay on the ocean for weeks at a time instead of days at a time. So I was pretty old at the point. I was old as far as uh, guides are concerned. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of the companies that I approached and said, like, you know, I, I would like to work for you guys and lead kayak tours or snorkel tours or whatever. I'm already in my third, like mid thirties. And usually the people that they're hiring are like 18, 19, 20, like, you know, on summer break from, from college. And they were just looking at me like, well, do you have previous experience guiding? You know, we don't, they didn't say it, but they're like, we don't take old people <laughs> that don't, that haven't already have experience. And I'm like, 35 is not old, but I kind of realized like, well, compared to these kids, I am old, you know, a less flexible, <laughs> <laughs> more prone to injury, etc. So it took, it took some convincing. I, I, I applied online and then I just started showing up at these, you know, places and, and they would say, okay, we'll have somebody call you back. I'm like, I can wait. And they would just pretty, pretty much annoyed them into giving me a job. That's it's a decent strategy. Like there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's, I will be here until you employ me. And just stay there for or or just tell me no way and then i'll leave <laughs> but if you if you leave me like in between like maybe somebody don't get back i'm like well, i'm gonna stay then yeah that's a, that's a gap that's a, that's pretty much a yes they just haven't said it yet you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> no it's amazing it's great to see that you know it actually have taken that initiative and getting out there and doing it you know it's why not why not and you know make the most of it you know it's I mean, is it a busy industry there? Is that is that a you know something that's always always a lot of demand for? Um, there's definitely a you know, Southern California has a huge tourism industry. Um, there's also a lot of people that ever since they're young say that they're gonna move to California, you know, sunshine and Hollywood and you know, whatever else. So there's a there's a there's a large tourism industry but there's also a large demand that people that want to live out there out here you know so yeah it's kind of <laughs> it's it's competitive what's what's your ideal world then i mean it's it's i take it you know sort of would it be to spend more time out there or what what would be your go-to yeah i'm trying to find a balance right now actually um with with the whole world upside down the last year um I, I feel like I'm trying to figure out like how to get back into it and, and have enough energy to, uh, you know, be effective at everything that I'm doing and kind of figure out how to time manage. And it's been, it's been a, it's been a struggle and a challenge, but I think I'm making progress. Yeah. That's always, it's always good to, you know, actually get out and, you know, see what's, what's there for you. And, mm -hmm. and in terms of, I mean, is there, you know, sort of an opportunity, I suppose, to really go dive and, and I mean, do, do you normally dive or snorkel or is it a mixture of both or what would you be your go to? Yeah, so far I've uh, I've only done um, snorkeling and free diving and free diving. You don't have any kind of oxygen tanks. You're just holding your breath and diving down. I, I mean, you see some of these guys doing pretty extreme stuff. I mean, is it? I mean, is it, it's a mixture of both, is it? You know, you actually get down and to, to be immersed in, in that world and, you know, sort of yeah. seeing different, you know, seeing different parts of, it's all in the sea, I take it, is it? Or is it, do you do any lake work still? Um, Every now and then, I'll, if I'm in freshwater, it's kind of like, it's, it's just because that's, what's there. <laughs> I, I would, I would rather be in the ocean, but Hey, since I'm here in Ohio or, you know, Lake Tahoe or whatever, there's water. 
So I might as well get in and put my mask on and see what I could find. It's, it's amazing how much more biodiverse the ocean is than freshwater. Really? Why is that? That's a good question. I don't know. Something, maybe, maybe it's bigger. <laughs> so there's more animals. I don't know. But yeah, <clears throat> pretty much if you take, you know, a drop of ocean water versus a drop of, you know what? I'm not positive. That's true. I'm not, I'm not even going to go there, but there's definitely a lot more animals in ocean life in the salt water. Um, it depends on where you are too. You know, if you go way out to the open ocean, that's pretty much like a desert. There's hardly any animals out there. You know, most mm. of the animals live close to the shore, most of the close to shore where the nutrients are coming off the land into the water and sure, interactions so. would make a lot of sense wouldn't it really you know a lot more as you say there's a lot more feeding life and everything else that's going on and so tell me are you do you go fishing is that is that a bit of a no-no where where do you sit on that side <laughs> yeah i i when i was a kid i did a lot of fishing um i do some fishing now uh not really like regularly i do I do eat a lot of urchin, uni, um, in Southern California, or it's like Southern Central California. There's okay. this thing called the Santa Barbara Channel. It's the water in between the Channel Islands and the mainland California. And that specific area is renowned for the best urchin in the world. Uh, it's absolutely delicious. And it's challenge. It's kind of challenging finding that finding ones that are, um, during their spawning cycle where the meat is the best to eat. So it's kind of just an excuse to get in the water. Um, the urchin in California are also a problem. They've, they've been growing out of control. So by catching them and eating them, I'm actually doing a service to the ecosystem. So that's the animal that I would say I spend the most time capturing. Um, I do also catch spiny lobster and crabs and scallops and a lot of things that I can just grab with my hands. Um, for some reason, I've been kind of drawn to capturing things with my hands ever since I was a kid. Um, but I, you know, every now and then I'll do some rod and reel fishing. When you say catching, I mean, catching crabs, that's, do you have gloves? Do you? <laughs> so, yeah. I imagine yeah. that could go quite, quite badly wrong or sore and, you know ways. what? I, I don't want to jinx it, but I don't think I've ever been pinched too bad by a crab. I've had one like I I have I do have gloves, but they could pinch right through the gloves. You know, they're not hmm. pun, pinch proof, but like the glove was a little bit too big for me. And the tip of it was kind of tipping off the thing. And the crab grabbed that tip that wasn't my finger, but my glove and just clamped down on that. And I guess I got lucky that time. But um, yeah, when you grab them, certain species are faster than others with the pinching. Um, the ones, yeah, the ones I'm grabbing, yeah, you, you kind of grab the base of the claw. So then you demobilize one claw. So it can't pinch you with that one because you're holding it. The other one's still going. And then what, what you do is you kind of lock their claws in on itself. So one claw is grabbing the other claw. Then if you wrap like this is the claw, you just kind of wrap your hand over both of them that's how it's supposed to work usually it gets a little messier than that especially when you know you're 40 50 feet under the water on one breath of air and that thing is also going into a little crack or crevice as you're trying to pull it out you know it gets sometimes it gets a little messier than that but that's the idea have it just kind of pull, fold its claws over each other so then it, it's kind of demobilized what's what's your downtime then under the water how long would you be down i i don't have a very good breath hold um when I was working in Maui last year, it was, it got better because I was out there every day, pretty much. Um, I'm comfortably under the water less than a minute. Yeah. I could, I could probably last longer, but definitely don't want to push your, push your limits in that situation. Yeah. That's not a sort of a, oh, well, listen, we'll try harder the next time. It's, it's a wee bit more serious. Yeah. Now, right. Yeah. There are, you know, there are people that train and they, they usually do that on land, you know, they'll, they'll train their lungs to mm. deal with carbon dioxide poisoning is what it's called. <laughs> you know, you, if you're, uh, if you're not breathing in enough oxygen, that carbon dioxide spreads through your body and, it, and uh, the, the uncomfortable effects of it, you kind of treat your, train your body to get used to that. Yeah. So I mean, going down and getting crab and lobster and all that, it's, 
Sounds sounds pretty exotic, really. I mean, is it? I mean, would that be all for personal use or commercial, or what, what way do you go with it? Um, definitely personal. Hmm. The in California, there's a um, very uh, it's very regulated. The fisheries are very regulated. We have a lot of people in California, and we want to make sure that we're not over harvesting or uh, you know pressuring some of these populations to extinction. So. In order to get a commercial license for anything, you're looking at astronomical amounts of money and a lot of responsibility. So I, I don't really have interest in that anyways. So I'll get my uh, recreational fishing license and then you have to get a, it's called ocean enhancement, which allows you to take the invertebrates like crabs and lobster. So I get that every year and, um, you know, catch food for myself and then my friends, you know, if I have some extra, you know, I love to share it and make some scallop tacos for friends. That's always a good time. They bring the beer, I bring the food and uh, yeah, all so, within the limits. <laughs> there's something, there's something very primal, isn't it? I mean, literally going out and grabbing your food, you know, either sort of lumping it on the head with a bat or you know <laughs> picking it up off the ocean floor or thereabouts you know there's something really quite rustic or quite yeah down to yeah for that. sure yeah with with the you know the big lobster it people say wrestle and it's pretty pretty literal you know you'll you'll literally be wrestling that thing it's you know trying to get away like hugging it up against your chest to kind of keep it in place and it's there's nothing like it. Like I've, once you get that big lobster up onto your kayak and, and, you know, make up some dinner that night. Oh, it's, you can't beat that. It's a really good um, primal sense of satisfaction. And tell me what does urchin taste like? I don't think I've ever heard of it or even. Yeah. It's called, if, if you go to like a fancy sushi restaurant, um, usually like in bigger cities, I guess Mm -hmm. um, you can get what's called uni uni that's okay. that's that's urchin and if it's if you look at the price and go yeah that sounds reasonable i should try the urchin don't try the urchin <laughs> and the reason is it's extremely it's extremely uh difficult to prepare it it's if you don't know what an urchin is or if any of your listeners don't know it's this uh uh creature it's kind of a ball and then it's it's pretty much a skull like it's a really sh- hard ball of a creature and then on top of that ball are all of these you know hundreds of razor sharp spines that stick up out of it and those spines move around and that's how they walk they actually move those spines around on the bottom of the ocean and they eat algae so in order to in order to get through the spines crack open the 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 skull part of it and then and then get the um it's actually their reproductive organs that you're eating to get those out and to clean it off and there's a bunch of algae inside of them as well and don't really want the algae you just want the meat so it's a very uh intense progress process and it's only fresh for about a day or two so in order to get something from the ocean keep it alive process it if you see it and it's cheap then it's not even worth eating because it's probably going to be on the verge of being rotten or bad or not good um, I think people, I think some sushi restaurants just sell it as like a gimmick and they don't care. Like, oh yeah, these people, they don't know what it's supposed to taste like. So whatever. If you go to a really good sushi restaurant and it's pretty expensive and you're like, oh, that's, that's outrageous, <laughs> expensive, but this is a good, you know, a good sushi restaurant and you want to try something. Yeah. Then you try it or come out and visit me and I'll, I'll let you try some. Yeah. How are you with the cooking? Then are you a dab on the catching on the cook or? Oh yeah. Love the cooking process. Um, a lot for me and from what I've read is, you know, cooking and preparing food is like 90% just selecting good ingredients. And with urchin, uh, the way that I like to do it is I put that meat and it's, uh, chill it a little bit in California, the water's cold, so it's already cold, but, um, chill it a little bit, put it in a shot glass with a little bit of a uh, sriracha, green onion and ponzu sauce, which is like a a soy sauce with a citrus or some kind of sweet, just a little bit of each of those ingredients, mostly the meat, and then just kind of do like, like a whiskey shot, you know, and then you just kind of let the flavors marinate in your mouth. And it's, it's expensive for a reason. It's, it's an out of body experience. Like 
I, I describe it as like listening to a symphony, you know, you have like the opening act and you're like, oh, that's, that tastes good. And then it goes to like, a, then it just switches to a whole nother movement. And then it has this grand finale and then has like this lingering, uh, lingering like taste that, that happens. It's, it's, a, it's an experience. It's definitely an experience. Wow. I love it. I mean, that, that sort of knowing what to do with it as well. I mean, you catch it, you prepare it, you, you know, you have it there and sounds awesome. Great, great excuse for a get together too. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just tell me, I mean, in terms of, you know, animals and we, we, we sort of jokingly started with that, you know, of animals and sort of um, really sort of interactions you've had with animals. I mean, wh- where do you sit on that? You know, what, what's your sort of bite record or, what's what's what stands out for you <laughs> you know what's funny pete um uh, i'll have friends that you know they won't see me for a couple of years and they'll say hey remember that time we went out snorkeling and and you got a uh, uh urchin spine lodged in your knee or whatever and i don't even remember it like i'll vaguely remember it so i can't even tell you like i don't have a log book i don't keep track <laughs> my mom was telling me the other day like when i was a kid I used to was, was like pick it up the snake. I pick it up and it would bite me, and then I put it down. And I pick it up and it would bite me. And then <laughs> she said like the maintenance guy came over, like a construction guy or maintenance guy was like, "Hey little buddy, let me show you how to pick up a snake so it doesn't bite you." I don't remember any of this. Like very vaguely remember it, you know. So even even stories that I don't remember that other people will tell me of <laughs> of me getting messed up by animals. It's like there's a lot of them. <laughs> I have this vision of you getting bitten to bits until you learn how to pick it up. Yeah, like what kind of stupid kid gets bit and then picks up the snake again, expecting something different to happen. Like <laughs> stupid or persistent, one or the other. It's like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hard to know, right? Yeah. So tell me, I mean, like the podcast, where what was the idea? I mean, I think it's a great concept, you know, and, and really it's it's you know, there's gonna be some awesome stories out of it, no doubt yeah the um i was telling my brother about a story i uh accidentally got between a humongous sea lion that was probably 700 pounds accidentally got between the sea lion and its baby in the water and uh that is that thing chased me for about a quarter mile (laughs) and i couldn't swim fast enough man i was just i was trying to get away with it and it's swimming zigzags between me and beside me, this giant, massive sea lion. If it wanted to, it could, you know, bite my arm in half. And uh, it, terrifying, you know, my, my mask was all fogged up. I couldn't breathe. I told my brother about it like the next day and he's just laughing. He goes, you know what? You have so many of these stories. You should just make a podcast and tell your story. <laughs> yeah, so that's not? how it started. Yeah. And then I maybe because I'm biased and I don't think my stories are that crazy. I started reaching out to people that had clearly more intense stories than I had, and then started talking to them and recording their stories as well. Oh well, I mean you're going to get such an amazing variety and all across the world of, you know, it's uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. What was it, Steve? Oh, it's Steve Irwin. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, Steve Irwin's story is pretty fascinating. That was that was extremely unlucky um you know millions of people get stung by stingrays over the years (laughs) maybe not every day but it's the amount of people that get stung by stingrays is extremely high the amount of people that get killed by a stingray is extremely low in my research i found um under 20 in all of like recorded human history of people that have actually died from a stingray um it's really really rare um it just, he, it, he got stung and he, he bled out, unfortunately, he just got stung too many times. There's too many open wounds in his chest. Um, if you get, if you, you know, if you have your arm ripped off, your leg ripped off, you could throw a tourniquet on that limb and stop mm. the bleeding. But whenever you get, if you have a bad wound on your chest, you can't really just tourniquet that off. You need your chest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That, you know, I mean, no matter what, you always have to have respect, don't you? Really? It's. You know, the power of even in the sea and whatever else, you know. Yeah. But, you know, despite probably being well, I mean, stingrays are pretty big animals, though, aren't they? I mean, that they're. they're mm-hmm. Wouldn't be. Yeah, there's big, there's a lot of different animals. species of stingrays. Mm-hmm. Um, the one that stung Steve Irwin, I forget the specific species, but it was a bigger one. Yeah, 
and it wasn't the poison that killed it. It was actually just the, the lacerations, the, you know, the punctures. It was just bleeding too much. Um, I've been stung by round stingrays a few times in my, in my foot and my ankle. And it's, it's extremely painful, but I was never at risk of dying. And most people that get stung are not at risk of death. Otherwise, hey, it's just extremely painful. Like, yeah, I mean, it's going to be, right? It's just, <laughs> yeah. You just learn to get over it. It's all comparable. I mean, what, what's been the worst sting for you or the worst bite? Um, the second time I was stung by a stingray, the, the barb went up inside the bottom of my foot really deep. And it, had, it got a lot of the, the toxin in my, in my foot. And it was, um, it was what I would describe as unbearable pain, the worst pain I've ever felt. Um, I got to a lifeguard and, uh, the, the lifeguard, I, I, I asked that I need, you know, some painkillers. Like I'm really suffering right now. And he said, we have morphine, you know, we're, we're qualified to administer morphine, which is extremely <laughs> intense, which is exactly, I was like, yeah, that that's about the right, you know, I've never, you know, <laughs> never been diagnosed morphine before, but I figured, yeah, that sounds good. Give me all, give me everything you have. <laughs> And he said, it doesn't matter because the way that, that that poison, it attacks your muscle. It doesn't attack your nervous system. So painkillers are designed for pain that comes from your nervous system. And the, or the toxins from the stingray barb, it's, it's like tightening up. And in, in, I think it's actually like attacking your muscle. And uh, there's nothing you can do for it. You can put it, you can put it in hot water. Hot water um, slows down the process or kind of supposed to neutralize the process but it was the toxin was so deep inside my foot we couldn't actually get the hot water in there and yeah just brutal pain for hours oh lord i can i'm sitting here wincing just as you're talking about it it's like it's kind of crazy yeah i mean as i was going through it i was like this is this is the most pain i've ever felt also this is going to be a good story to tell <laughs> Always good, you know, it's presenter, journalist, whatever. It's like, yeah, that really hurts. Where's my camera? Where's, how can I record this moment? Ah. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be uh, sort of there for the calls no matter what. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's better, it's better than not having a cause. Being in a painful cause is better than not having a cause. <laughs> so tell me about, I mean, the animals on land, do you still, do you still look after those guys? You, you still... Did it spend much time with oh yeah yeah definitely um uh love love hiking and uh i've been i've been getting into birds recently uh getting really excited to see a bird i saw an, I, I got a good picture of an allen's hummingbird uh last week out on out on one of the channel islands it was just hummingbirds are hard to get because they're constantly moving around my photography skills aren't that great but uh it was sitting on this little branch and as the sun was setting has this like kind of uh, reddish chest it was just it was just glowing like it was out of a disney movie or something got a good picture of that that was really exciting um i guess that's technically not a land animal more of an air animal <laughs> but yeah like, like birds i found some cool uh uh, tadpoles last week as well that was cool to watch them for a while i heard a, a frog or a toad chirping but like every time it chirped i couldn't see where it was coming from so it, that went on for like an hour and then i gave up and left but yeah i'm always it, pretty much any kind of animals out whether it's in someone's backyard on the side of the street or in the ocean i i definitely love watching them and observing them photos etc yeah, so, I mean, do you, and do you still collect animals? Do you bring animals home? Or have you gotten out of that habit? Yeah, you know what? I haven't really had a home in a long time, so that's that's good for the animals that I would <laughs> probably want as pets. Um, <laughs> I uh, yeah. Also, I think as I get older, I kind of realize that like wild animals are meant to be wild. You know, um, maybe with like the exception of like some fish maybe you know if you put them in a big fish tank and take good care of them maybe they don't know the difference they probably do know the difference i don't know but uh yeah I, I i kind of when i was a younger kid you know anything that moved i would want that to be like my animal now i've learned to kind of appreciate them in their natural habitat more <laughs> appreciate them and leave them alone 
It's like yeah. sometimes, yeah. <laughs> so tell me, what, what does leisure and pleasure look like for you then? I mean, where where do you go? What do you do? Um, that's a that's an interesting one. I I think probably taking photos of animals is is uh, the thing. I don't make money from that. So it's purely just for my own enjoyment, you know, and, and the challenge is just for me. Um, a lot of the other things that I get a lot of joy out of, I also am lucky enough to do it for work, you know. And sometimes what happens when you do something for work is it becomes a job, <laughs> which, you know, if something that you love becomes a job and you still love it, well, it's a job, but you still love it. It's good. But I think having having hobbies that don't have that added pressure of, you know, well, I'm depending on this to make me money. It's really important to have some of those hobbies, low stakes, you know, it's purely for enjoyment. Um, there's no like really worries involved with it. So for me right now, taking photos is, is really just pure joy and uh, leisure and pleasure, as you said. It's interesting. I mean, you, you sort of hold a passion there for the, the sort of cooking and the preparing the, the photos, the getting out in nature, you know, it's all very, a lot of creation there, a lot of, you know, ruggedness and, and out there really. It's, it's just, just, and has it always been with you that, that those sort of passions? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Where do you see it Ever going? since I can remember. Down the line, what would you, what would you like to do out of it, you know? ask that again so down the line i mean where would you like to see it go um i'd like to figure out how to uh have a a, a permanent settlement <laughs> whether it's an apartment or a you know a cabin or something that i'm probably not going to be there most of the time but at least i have that where i can have some things set up and have a place to call home if i if I want that, if I want to be home, um, I think generally in my life, I'm still, you know, traveling and out and about and off to the next adventure more than anything. But I do notice that there's a lot of, uh, kind of, uh, less anxiety when I know I have somewhere to go, like after this adventure, like, okay, I know where somewhere to go. You do adventure after adventure and not knowing where I'm going to sleep the next night constantly, it can kind of add up to some anxiety and stress. No, I can imagine. I can't imagine. So tell me, I mean, if you were to describe your fire in the belly then in one or two words, what would it be? Hmm. One or two words. Um, I like sharing the stoke. You know, that's kind of like a surfer term, I guess. I'm not a surfer, but I steal it. When you're stoked, you're just so excited, you know, and if I can share that with somebody else, whether it's um, doing a kayak tour or, or taking somebody out snorkeling to see some awesome animals. And then I see that excitement in their face and I've shared it with them. There's, you can't, you can't even compare that with anything. That's the best feeling for me. No, I love it. And tell me what, what sort of questions, you know, on your podcast, you know, what's your, your main thing that you like to ask a lot of guests? I really like to ask them, um, more than technically what happened, you know, I, I want to know technically what happened and what, what they were doing that caused this animal to attack them or you know, what the conditions were, were they breeding, were they eating, whatever's going on. Um, I really like to get into like, what did it feel like? Like, what were you thinking? What were you feeling? And unfortunately, <laughs> a lot of them just say, I was just acting out of instinct. You know, I wasn't thinking anything. It, it, a lot of these things happen so fast, but afterwards you can feel things you know like oh well, how did you feel once you got away from it how did you feel the next day you know and i've got some really fascinating answers from people um some things that you'd expect you know like you can't take life for granted you know you go through it a, a really traumatic near life or death experience like that and you know you can't take you can't take the next day for granted you, you're gonna you're gonna value your family more your friends um, maybe put the phone down and, and enjoy your, your human interactions a little bit more, you know? So, so I've got a couple really great answers along that line. And then, um, a lot of the guys act like they were completely, you know, 
unemo- un- unaffected emotionally like oh yeah whatever I, don't know. <laughs> I think that's like a man thing to like deny that you have any emotions ever um but I'm, I'm trying to figure out as an interviewer how to like tease out those emotions <laughs> <laughs> I think I could probably learn something from you about that. You seem to be pretty good at that. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, just just go for the sort of the slight tear in the eye, you know, just just yeah, soften them up a bit. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's awesome. Listen, I mean, it's, it's I mean, it's great. I love the topic. I love the you know the idea, and and it's great. You know, it's a sort of a you know we all sort of talk about war wounds, and you know the one that got away, and all that. You know, it's when you are the food or you are the bait. You know it's um that's an awesome idea so tell us where, where can people sort of find out more track you down hunt you down stalk you any of the above yeah all of the above definitely please um i'm on uh the website is the teeth and on uh twitter instagram and facebook it's teeth podcast so at teeth podcast love it love it so Jeremy, I mean, is there a final message you'd like to leave our listeners? Yeah, um, I really love your theme of fire in the belly. And um, I think especially during, you know, the past year, we've all been focusing on what's essential, you know, what's, you know, food, water, shelter. And, and I think that having something that you have that you're excited for outside of those essentials is also essential (laughs) whether it's you know sharing the stoke for me you know like sharing the things that i'm passionate about with other people so that they can they can also be excited about it um or if it's making music or whatever it is for you know the listeners i just really love that that um maybe taking a moment, you know, taking a moment once a week and, and saying like, is there something that I'm really, that I have a fire in my belly about this week? And did I feed that fire and cultivate it and stay passionate? Or did I just ignore it and go through my, you know, day-to-day life? And I really love it. I, I don't know if that's exactly what your podcast is, but that's kind of what I'm interpreting it as. And I think that that's, that's, that's something that should be thought of as essential. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Find your passion and you know, lean into it. You know, it's life short. You know, it's um, as you say, all those things that people realize that, yeah, what's the point in being busy if you're not happy or you know you're not living in your passion? So, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's all about. Cool, Jeremy. Listen, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate you sharing. And uh, yeah, until the next time, stay safe and uh, enjoy yourself. Why not get out there? Thank you so much, Pete. It's been really fun talking with you. Awesome. Thank you.